like to welcome everyone to the third in our Crisis 2021 series um, of panels hosted by the ACREA Crisis Communication Section. And we've been thankfully endorsed by the International Public Relations Association and hosted by Leeds Beckett University. Um, I, I think I know a good chunk of folks, but I'm Audrey Dears Lawson, Senior Lecturer at Leeds Beckett and the Chair for now of the ACREA Crisis Communication Section. Uh, just again, a couple of reminders. So we're recording and um, make sure you keep your microphones and cameras off unless you want to appear throughout on our video. For our speakers, we'll begin with the presentations. And if you've attended our others, we'll go through all of our presentations first. The speakers will have about 10 to 12 minutes for their presentations. So at about 10 minutes, I'll give some little signal just as an indicator for for the speakers. Um, and today's panel, though, is comprised of individual presentations submitted to us um, for the ACREA Crisis Communication section and Crisis 2021 that centered on exploring a more sustainable world. Globally, when the COVID-19 pandemic begins to subside, business as usual will probably mean addressing issues of sustainability, wicked problems like sustainable consumption, climate change, refugees, and the victims left in the wake of crises and disasters that all of this is becoming increasingly relevant to all populations. So the presentations in the section will explore the role of communication as we forge hopefully a more sustainable world. Each of the presentations in this panel explores a different aspect of creating a more sustainable world, along with the intersection of stakeholder attitudes or behaviors, activism, and the role that different types of organizations will play in shaping the future. These presentations collectively suggest that there are more meaningful roles for all segments of society to play, from the actions we can all take towards more responsible consumption to the actions that organizations can take in shaping support and care for the most vulnerable in our society. So to that end, we'll begin with a presentation from Tanya Habermeyer and Marina Sandman from the University of Augsburg in Germany, exploring the role that emotion and communication strategies can have in addressing the fashion industry's contributions to climate change. In their presentation, Emotions as Frames to Mobilize Recipients in a Crisis. And I will turn that over to them. Thank you very much. I will start my presentation. So hello everyone, my name is Tanya. I research at Augsburg University, like Audra just mentioned, and it is my pleasure to present to you our work today on mobilizing recipients in a crisis with the specific focus on the clothing mass production crisis. So I will start first with our theoretical background. Every year, clothing mass production evicts 4 million tons of CO2, uses up renewable as well as non-renewable resources, and releases toxic materials into water bodies. Um, and this issue even continuously increases um, because clothing mass production produces clothing continuously faster in lower quality, which is then discarded faster, a phenomenon called fast fashion. In the EU alone, 1.5 to 2 million um, tons of clothing are thrown away every year. So our study focuses therefore on crisis communication on the clothing, clothing mass production crisis with its decisive negative influences on the environment, which is becoming a bigger issue every year. And this study analyzes the effectiveness of communication strategies aiming to make consumers aware of the issues for them to consider in their consumption choices. So advocacy campaigns aim to engage recipients um, for a topic using various communication strategies. One of the most important communication strategies to engage recipients is framing. The active process of selectively highlighting information and positions to suggest specific interpretations of media messages to recipients. And Betting House suggests to focus in this context on emotions when making aspects salient in media messages. 
And he suggests this as focusing on recipients' emotions regarding their own actions in media messages can be especially relevant for activating behavior change. So the focus on emotion regarding one's actions can then be relevant for activating a change in the behavior. And Nabi therefore developed his emotions as frames theory which means using framing with a specific focus on emotions. And he suggests that media messages can trigger a certain emotion in recipients, which they use as an interpretational foil for understanding the media message. According to Nabi, um, framing negative emotions connected to a behavior especially heightens a need for action. As recipients see that a need um, to change something is relevant, um, and um, if negative emotions regarding a behavior or non-behavior are elicited, um, for example, such as fear um, regarding um, possible negative consequences or such as guilt because of um, past behaviors and um, possibly um, the f um, if the behavior continues, possibly um, eliciting even further negative consequences, um, the focus on negative emotions could then heighten a need for action in the recipients. And Nabi's theory has previously been analyzed in the field of political communication research, and he um, was able to show um, effectiveness of fear and anger frames, anger and sadness frames, and fear and hope frames on various um, dependent variables. So in the environmental context, Emotions were previously um, analyzed only as mediators in the process with gain framing and loss framing. So um, gain framing is um, supposed to show the positive consequences of um, one's behavior and loss framing is supposed to show the negative consequences of one's behavior. And um, then um, along the process, the emotions were analyzed as mediators. And Bilancic and colleagues were able to show um, that portraying negative behavior consequences heightened willingness to sacrifice. And so um, to actually start a behavior to sacrifice um, specific time and um, energy in one's life um, to change um, something in one's life um, via increasing the mediator's fear and guilt. And um, for positive consequences um, via increasing the mediator hope. So the relevance of emotions in the process of environmental decision making could already be proven in, in the environmental contexts, but only as mediators so far. So therefore, um, as emotions as framing was used effectively within political communication research and um, in the context of environmental communication, emotions as mediators could be shown to be relevant with fear and guilt as two relevant negative emotions. Um, this study analyzes fear frames and guilt frames used as direct emotions as frames, as Nabi suggested, in communication materials for advocating for solving the clothing industry crisis. And the fear frames, um, as described by Ellsworth and Scherer and Krone, um, focus on emotions related to future consequences of current behavior, so the forward perspective, and the guilt frames focus on emotions related to current consequences of past behavior, so the backward perspective of um, behavior that could have had negative consequences. And um, for our experimental design, we base our second experimental factor on research on using fear-inducing messages. Um, so research showed that affecting fear as a mediator in health or environmental communication um, could already prove that a proposed threat in media messages should be communicated with resolving actions to effectively translate the emotional reactions into behavioral intentions. So always the resolving action should be portrayed as well alongside with um, communicating the proposed threat. And therefore, um, this study analyzes fear and guilt frames in an experimental setting alongside with the exper second experimental factor, um, behavioral suggestions versus factual reasoning to analyze um, the role of um, communicating resolving actions alongside emotions. <laughs> 
This study therefore analyzes um, a two with two um, between subjects online experiment. So emotions as frames, either fear frames or guilt frames are combined with follow up information, either behavioral suggestions or factual depiction. And we analyze this in an advocacy campaign on um, sustainable clothing consumption. So um, within our method, 218 participants read an accordingly modified advocacy campaign and answered scales on um, our relevant dependent variables, which were in our context attitude, behavioral intentions and information search intention, um, as well as um, perceived responsibility and induced emotions as possible mediating variables. And so for our results, we could see that um, two factorial ANOVAs did not show any effects on the, be on the dependent variables attitude, behavioral intentions and information search intention. And as we analyzed possible um, mediating variables, we could see that um, facts um, were mediated um, via the emotion fear on the dependent variable of attitude as well as on the dependent variable of behavioral intentions. Um, and we analyzed for further mediating effects and um, we did not find any effects via perceived responsibility on attitude, behavior intentions or information search intention. So let's discuss our results. Um, our study showed that in an environmental context, fear and guilt as emotions as frames um, did not significantly differ in their effects on attitude and behavioral intentions. And um, as we looked at our results descriptively, we could see that the fear frame as well as the guilt frame generated higher scores in combination with factual depiction for the relevant variables, attitude and behavioral intentions. And furthermore, we could see that fear as an induced emotion showed as relevant as a mediator for using factual depiction. So interestingly, when working with emotions as frames um, in this environmental context, we could see in contrary to previous research on fear appeals that um, there were better descriptive results when these emotions as frames were combined with facts instead of with behavioral intentions. So it can be assumed that for an environmental advocacy campaign, emotions for negative influences of either previous um, or possible future behavior, so guilt and fear, are both equally relevant in their connection to behavior, as we did not find any um, significant differences here, and also um, no um, decisive descriptive differences. And as emotions as frames are um, being communicated regarding behavior, um, the connection to behavior might already be uh, sufficiently inherent with behavioral suggestions not um, additionally necessary. And future research should analyze the role of fear and guilt in the process of environmental behavioral decision making and should compare emotions as frames in experimental settings to other communication strategies. One second, no, I, ah, sorry, I have to share my screen again. I don't know what happened, but could you see the last slide? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. I will just go back to the presentation. All right, um, and so therefore analyzing how to raise awareness for sustainable clothing consumption um, instead of clothing mass production could then contribute to decisively lowering CO2 emissions, releasing less toxic materials and wasting less resources. Um, so now I have come to the end of this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your feedback later on. Thank you for that. You for that. Um, so our next presentation will be from Delia Dumitrich, sorry, from Erasmus University in the Netherlands, and Juliana Source from Eberhard Karls University in Germany. And they focus on the evolution and adaptation of social movements during crises by mapping digital protest tactics in their presentation, adapting activist repertoires of action to the pandemic. Yeah, thank you very much, Audra. Let me share my screen uh, and confirm with you guys that you're seeing uh, my slides. Yeah. 
No problem. Okay. Just so you know, you have disappeared from my uh, screen, so I don't see any human being. All I see is my screen. So if there is anything that does not work out, then please let me know. Unmute yourselves and let me know. Um, so yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dilia Dumitrica, and I'm also presenting on behalf of my colleague, uh, Dr. Juliana Sorse, on our research project looking into the adaptation of activist repertoires of action to the pandemic. Now, um, in this project, we looked at how the pandemic was forcing movements to adapt their tactics of action and their message. But today I will only talk about the adaptation of tactics of action. The adaptation of the message is part of a different paper. I'm happy to share it with you if everyone is interested. Now, the two images that you see on my slide right now illustrate this forced tactical adaptation that we are interested in. You see the shift from the movement's iconic school strikes to the digital strike. And these were the questions that drove our project. We wanted to know which tactics of action could be found in this uh, transition to an online environment. And for those of you who are not familiar with the sociology of social movements vocabulary, Tactics of action refer to means through which movements act collectively to make claims on political structures and to demand change. So the focus here is on what movements do in order to achieve their goal. We are also interested in how these new tactics of action are impacting the movement itself, as well as which factors appear to be significant in this rapid adaptation during times of crisis. In terms of, uh, of, of the research design, uh, we collected data from the Facebook pages of the National Fridays for Future collectives across the European Union. Facebook was used across all of these collectives and wherever other social media channels like Instagram or Twitter were also present, they mostly reposted the same content that we found on, on Facebook. There are, of course, numerous local F Fridays for Future collectives, but they are often networked to the national page. Our data collection took place between March 11th and April 24th, when the movement organized its first global digital strike. We have submitted these posts to a qualitative content analysis, which I can address if anyone has specific questions about it. Our study revealed four types of action that the movement performed online, clockwise starting from top left. Contentious action calls out on power structures, usually in an oppositional manner. Now, these come closer to the movement's iconic school strikes that you might be familiar with. Partnership development consists of creating or maintaining alliances with other social actors that can support or amplify the movement. Community engagement actions target the movement's followers, seeking to renew their support for the cause. Finally, information and education publicize the cause and the actions of the movement. So what I want to do in the following slides is briefly illustrate uh, each of these four. Now, when the pandemic was declared, Greta Thunberg announced the cancellation of physical events and the move to online spaces. And almost immediately, the, the Fridays for Future collectives followed through. What you see here on the slide is an example from the Romanian chapter announcing its participation in the online global strike with a rather long post using emoticons and hashtags, a common tactic across the collectives. The Romanian chapter also provided a set of explanatory slides for how to join the online strike. This other post comes from the Portugal collective. It's a similar idea digitalizing the school strike, and the post also showcases the results, these photos that you see here. This type of contentious action was the most prevalent. It had a simple formula, create a sign, take a picture, and then share it online. The formula was reused for alternative contentious events called challenges, where participants were asked to respond to and engage with specific topics. Not all events were purely online. A few blended online with offline action. Now, in this case, this image that you see here uh, depicts uh, the, the initiative of a Berlin collective 
who printed followers, slogans and messages and then displayed them in front of the Bundestag. And such online offline blends were often more successful in attracting media coverage, which you see here illustrated in the news article from Deutsche Welle. As for the other contentious tactics, they were notable through their general absence or at best marginal use. Now, in terms of partnership development, there was surprisingly only very little cross promotion among the collectives. While most reposted or reworked Greta Thunberg's or the Fridays for Future International Hub's messages into their own posts, only Austria regularly featured posts by satellite groups within the larger movement. On the other hand, over half of the national collectives in our sample shared posts by other organizations such as Greenpeace or Zero Waste Network. A few also co-organized online events or promoted various um, uh, environmental campaigns. A couple of collectives also collaborated on the production of original content, such as video news or podcast series. In terms of community engagement, this was quite popular. Posting humorous and light content or thanking followers for participation was a common tactic. You see it in the first post here with this collage of photos of followers participating in an online event. Another common tactic was to create opportunities for online socialization. Denmark, for instance, organized the Digital Book Club. The Czech Republic went for digital movie nights, while Spain asked followers to make climate-inspired art. Finally, all collectives were trying to also educate and inform their followers. And education often took the form of the webinar. This was the most popular type of action online, with half of the collectives in our sample using it on an almost weekly basis. The collectives also shared international and local news articles, but only four of them invested in in-house production of news and commentary on climate issues. So this brings me to a sort of a wrap up of our findings. During the early stages of adapting to the social distancing and lockdown measures, contentious action took a direct hit. In a way, this may be expected because the movement had to scramble for alternatives and to improvise. Yet the digital strikes and challenges were ultimately oriented towards existing followers, keeping them engaged rather than calling out on political structures or achieving amplification through news coverage. Overall, the crisis reoriented the movement um, and, and the movement's tactics of action towards existing followers. Finally, contentious action was reduced to this very simple formula. You make a sign, you take a picture of yourself holding it, and then you share it on social media. And this enables the individual to personalize the message. But it also reduces activist participation to a low cost individual contribution that's, that does not seem to achieve public visibility. In that sense, such formulas for participation and such tactics of action are not impactful. The symbolic power of the bodies in the streets is not replaced by something that can achieve the same political impact. In terms of factors mediating the adaptation to crisis, two appeared as important, leadership and level of professionalization. In our study, top-down leadership was central to the movement's adaptation to the crisis. This goes against the proponents of digital activism who suggest social media on its own can aggregate individual actions and make them politically impactful. Second, professionalization matters. I guess this is not news. Adaptation depends on the availability of committed volunteer structures with technical and activist know-how. This is not a critique of the Fridays for Future collectives because it's not easy to act during crisis, but this is merely to point out the importance of having these organizational structures and having this know-how, even in a digital environment. So let me conclude uh, with a summary of the lessons that our study can offer for forced tactical adaptation in the realm of activism. We have distilled here four general lessons about adaptation. Prioritize strategic objectives, keep an explicit focus on contentious action, balance adaptation and innovation 
and address all four types of actions uh, that, that, that we came up with, fight, engage, inform and collaborate. We also made a few recommendations specific to digital activism. I'm realizing that you might not be able to see them very well. I was planning on letting you read them, uh, but um, yeah, I, I'm happy to share uh, more about this in the Q&A if it comes to that. So I want to thank you for uh, your attention and I'm going to attempt to uh, end my slideshow. Thank you very much, Delia. And in our third presentation, uh, Tanya, Janine Blessing, and Rebecca Hellmeyer from the University of Augsburg analyzed the personification and fear-inducing messages by animal rights organizations in order to try to reduce meat consumption and its negative environmental consequences. In their presentation, Combating the Meat Consumption Crisis, Effects of Activist Communication Strategies for More Stable Nutrition. Thank you very much. OK, it is um, my pleasure to also present you a second study of our work today. Um, and I will present this one with my colleague Janine um, on the topic of combating the meat consumption crisis, effects of activist communication strategies for a more sustainable nutrition. So first of all, I will start with the theoretical background. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why it keeps on sliding out. Um, so as the world population is continuously growing, ensuring a sustainable alimentation is becoming more and more a decisive and one of the most important worldwide challenges. One significant part of um, worldwide alimentation currently consists of meat consumption. And the EU um, plays a crucial role here with 42 million tons of meat consumed per year. And the consequences of this um, are not only numerous health and uh, numerous negative health consequences, but also a huge global negative impact on the environment. And activist um, organizations aim to raise awareness for this issue to deal with the crisis of global meat mass production with the goal of raising awareness and proposing alimentation alternatives. Here you can see a few of the most relevant animal activist organizations aiming to raise awareness for animal well-being, um, reducing meat mass production and proposing alternatives. So if we now take a deeper look into communication strategies of animal rights organizations, we can see two examples. Um, extreme rhetoric, which uses fear-inducing messages and depicting animals as human-like. This evokes emotional and cognitive reactions. I will start now with the extreme rhetoric and the fear-inducing messages. So using fear-inducing messages can be linked to Yanis and Feshbach's fear appeal strategy. And according to the extended parallel process model, also called EPPM, presenting a threat can trigger fear and therefore a need for action. And communicating it with resolving none actions can then result in behavior change. The problem is that a too high induced fear level can lead to negative effects, such as reactance. Um, so rejecting the message by feeling restricted in one's freedom. Um, back to animal rights activists, we know that they are often criticized for the radicalness in their communication, as these campaigns like fear appeal research shows, could lead to rejection reactions among the recipients. The effects of their extreme rhetoric on recipients have yet to be analyzed. Um, so the second most common communication strategy of animal activist organizations is personification, depicting animals in a humanized anthropomorphic way. So these organizations insert visual, so human body or behavior similarities or linguistic elements, for example, terms such as using corpses for dead animals or using the personal pronouns he, she, um, into their communication materials, depicting the animals as human-like. So they pursue the goal of presenting the animals as equal to humans, to the recipients, and therefore um, want to evoke empathy among the recipients. 
Um, they aim to trigger the recipients to adopt the perspective of the animals so that they identify themselves with them. Maletsky could show that empathetic care is um, relevant for animal protection. And um, with um, using the strategy of personification, organizations aim to oppose speciesism, the idea that humans are superior to non-human entities. So here you can see a few examples um, of inserting human body parts into um, communication materials with animals or um, also using some specific terms um, um, usually used in the context of humans. Um, research on using personifications on entities in other contexts could show that um, personification could foster processing, emotional con connection and um, memory, so remembering information that was used in the communication materials. And for the topic um, climate change, a study could show that personification of the planet Earth could um, already lead to a stronger connection to nature and also an increased willingness to protect nature. And Shelton and Rogers assume that fee appeals that lead people to protect themselves in other contexts should also be able to foster animal protection if they are used with um, um, combined with triggering empathy. And um, through using personification, the animal rights organizations aim to evoke empathy and uh, therefore animal protection. Um, so therefore, our study analyzes the effects of a communication form often used by animal rights organizations that uses fear appeals in combination with personification of animals. And we analyze effects on attitude and behavior to see um, whether this um, could be useful for tackling the meat consumption crisis. So now let's talk about the method. Um, we conducted uh, two. So we, as Tanya already said, we varied the description of the animal situation, personification versus no personification. And two, the description of the action necessity, so fear appeal versus no fear appeal between subjects online experiment. And 218 individuals participated. 64.7% uh, of them being female, and they were between the ages of 18 and 69. So, first of all, participants read a modified animal rights online article before answering a questionnaire. Yeah, let's talk about the results. What did we find out? Um, we conducted uh, two, factual, um, two factual ANOVAs, and they showed no effects for attitude or behavioral intentions. But we found a main effect of fear appeals for intentions to seek information. That means that participants with an article including a fear appeal indicated higher intention to seek information than participants who received an article with no fear appeal. Moreover, for a second questionnaire after two weeks, um, we had 150, uh, 150 participants and we found no effects again on attitude st uh, stability and on the conducted behavior. But we found, uh, interestingly, we found another effect for information search. Um, but in this case, a main effect uh, of no personification. So recipients with an article with no personification, they indicated more behavior of information of information search in the last two weeks than participants with personification. So yeah, the first uh, result was um, with the fear appeal and the second one then was uh, regarding the personification. Yeah, um, regarding mediation effects, um, yeah, we found uh, none of them. Uh, for fear appeals via fear or reactance and for personification via empathy or reactance on the dependent variables. Um, on the next slide, you can see the descriptive results of the four experimental groups in the dependent measures. So let's discuss our results. Um, so our study analyzed personification and fear inducing messages. So two very common communication strategies used by animal rights organizations. And um, the first communication strategy personification. Whoops, doesn't. Now we slide it out again. Okay. 
All right. Um, so the first communication strategy person, if you take your presentation again, I don't know what happened. We can see it. OK, I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong with my laptop. I hope it works now. OK, does it work now? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So the first um, communication strategy personification showed as not effective. Um, we found this, um, descriptively hardly even descriptively hardly any differences, and we even found a significant negative influence on information search. And for fear-inducing messages, um, descriptively we could see um, overall positive tendencies for mediating and dependent variables and a significant effect for information search. Um, however, um, we could also descriptively see lower values for behavior, which is a very important dependent variable in this context and um, higher values for reactants, um, so for negative defensive reactions. Um, so um, how could we discuss the, the findings that we did find? Um, since animal rights organizations are um, often criticized for their radicalness, possibly a less strong fear degree, um, as suggested by the fear appeal research, a medium level of communicated fear um, um, is best, according to Janis and Feschbach, could show um, positive significant effects beyond information search, and um, depicting more strongly the efficacy of resolving behaviors could then stimulate behavior. So um, the research on fear appeals um, showing that the medium level of communicated fear um, additionally um, with the efficacy of um, the resolving behaviors could um, be a, a very um, um, a very useful strategy for animal rights organizations to use instead of their very radical communication um, um, in this context. And as empathy um, could be shown to be particularly relevant for animal protection, and um, we could see positive tendencies for fear appeals. Future research should focus on which alternative depiction of personification, for example, visually, or which alternative communication strategy could foster empathy, empathy alongside the fear appeals, and could be therefore effective for animal and climate protection and contribute to solving the meat mass production crisis. And thank you very much for your attention, and we are looking forward to your feedback. Thank you both for that. Um, our next presentation is from Kel Bratas. He's a senior communications advisor from Norway. And I should also mention he has a brand new book out, Managing the Human Dimension of Disasters. And with this, our focus shifts from a focus on organizations and activists to those affected by crises. Kel's presentation focuses on the bereaved, survivors, and first responders to crises to better understand constructing victim support in the aftermath of a crisis. OK, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, having me here. I'm just going to share my presentation. You can see that. Yep. Great. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm very impressed with uh, the work all of you are doing and Audra's work in, in bringing us all together. I think it's uh, really nice to learn from uh, each other. Um, my focus is on what happens after a disaster, and that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, right now. Uh, I have found, and I, I know you guys will probably uh, know the same, that there are lots of articles, lots of books, lots of research on uh, planning for crisis, for preparing for crisis, for exercising, and for handling a crisis. But I have found that there is less information and less research done on what happens afterwards. And that has been my focus, and that's something I have wanted to try to change. Uh, so for the last uh, three years or so, I have been doing a research for this book that uh, Audra mentioned. And uh, it's focusing, as you mentioned, about uh, the bereaved, the survivors, and all the first responders that have to work uh, right after a disaster has taken place. Uh, the book came out last week, so this is very timely for me to, to talk about it. But all of my research, or lots of my research, has been based on personal meetings with people in all these uh, cities that I have uh, listed here. And I was very lucky in two ways. Uh, first, because I got a grant from a Norwegian Authors Association, 
and I spent all that money on travels so that I could talk to people in person, face to face. And it's my experience that that works best, especially when you're talking about difficult subjects uh, that I cover in this book. And the second uh, uh, thing that was very lucky for me was, of course, that I was able to do most of <clears throat> most of the research and all these travels before COVID-19. Uh, and of course, if this uh, was done right now, I would have done have to do everything uh, digitally. But I, I went to all these places and I met uh, lots of people who were either bereaved themselves and maybe they had lost someone uh, in a, a disaster. I talked to several survivors and a wide variety of first responders. And the research I have done has led me to develop this uh, kind of model uh, that I call the building blocks of victim support. And I have found that when talking to all these people all over the world, that there are some basic needs and they are listed in this uh, model. And uh, most of these topics then I have found need to be dealt with somehow uh, after a disaster has taken place. And we will also see that and we can already see some of this also after the COVID-19 crisis, which of course is being handled all over the world uh, right now. And some of these blocks are extremely important especially uh, the ones that deal with, um, you know, uh, victim identification and finding out who has been involved in a crisis. But also some of these other building blocks uh, prove to be important in various ways and at various times after a disaster. So I have tried to construct uh, this, uh, these building blocks, parts of the building blocks into a timeline which uh, explains uh, the different uh, time frames involved in the aftermath of handling a disaster. And I have found that uh, the first days are, of course, uh, very, very important. Uh, that's when you have to deal with uh, the onslaught of the crisis and you have to have plans and exercises in place so that you know exactly what to do. The next phase is the first year which has a lot of other types of challenges that I will come back to. And then the last phase is what I would say is indefinitely the following years, because uh, whenever I talk to people who have been uh, personally uh, affected by a crisis, they say that it, it never goes away uh, and the people will have uh, their lives changed forever when they have been in a crisis. So the timeline uh, that uh, reflects the first days uh, has to do with some of these challenges. I, I mentioned victim accounting, which has to do with finding out who has been involved in the accident or the disaster and who has survived and who are missing and who have died. Very, very important. And of course, lots of work is being done then by the police experts and other experts trying to find answer for answers for uh, the victims who have survived. Another difficult uh, subject is the family assistance centers that uh, we have seen after major disasters. And just the name is difficult uh, for some. And uh, the, the advice therefore is not anymore to call it a family assistance center, but an incident assistance center. So that after the Pulse shooting in Orlando, for example, we would have a Pulse Shooting Assistance Center. And the reason for that is that the center is open for not only family members, which we saw many examples of after the Pulse, Pulse Shooting in Orlando, for example. And of course, media and social media have a very, very important uh, uh, player and a very important role in the first days after a disaster. In the first year, there are other types of challenges you have to deal with site visits. In Norway, we have been involved uh, with two major site visits, and I was part of uh, one that uh, happened in Thailand in 2005, when we brought uh, survivors and uh, family members back to Thailand after the tsunami. And we also did something similar in Norway after the terror in Utøya, uh, 
in 2011 when we arranged for family members and survivors to go back to the island just one month after the terror attack. Other challenges include donations that you need to have a plan for, uh, support groups that uh, spring up. Some of them are very critical, especially towards uh, uh, companies that might have done something wrong, for example, an airline. And so you need to have uh, plans in place also for handling that. Personal belongings is also mentioned here. And uh, I've talked to many people who say that getting back a personal item from someone who died in a disaster is extremely important. It might not seem so important for us who are not part of it, but getting back a passport or a wedding band or a wedding ring is very, very important for someone who has lost someone in a disaster. And then in the following, following years, there are also uh, many challenges and some will be repeated year after year. For example, anniversaries. The first year uh, anniversary uh, is of course the most important, but we have seen many examples of anniversaries or special uh, arrangements, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 25 and even 50 years after a disaster took place. So that's also that needs to be thought of uh, in advance and have uh, systems for. We have also seen many challenges, uh, especially in Norway lately, uh, about movies and documentaries after the terror in Oslo and on Utøya. And uh, there are always big discussions about what is the right time for when a movie or a documentary should come out. We have had several about the Utøya shooting uh, in, in Norway, and there is a Netflix movie that is very good. But when they came out, there was lots of discussion in Norway and some people said that it was way too early and some people would say that it was way too late that this movie came out. So again, you need to, I, I believe, have a look at this model here and use that when you're planning for what happens after a disaster. The second part of my research has focused on people and I have tried to divide people affected by a crisis in two major groups, those who are directly affected and then those who are in a way first responders. And I have uh, really tried to expand the notion of what a first responder is because I believe it's not just uh, the people who arrive with blue lights, it's not just the police, the ambulance and the fire, uh, firemen and firewomen, it's also other people who are involved like leaders, uh, like communications uh, advisors, like reporters, like uh, clergy and ministers who are helping uh, people cope with what has happened. And of course, there are uh, some blurry uh, distinctions between these two groups. And sometimes, pe sometimes people can belong to, to both of the groups. And that's also th something we need to be aware of when you plan for the aftermath of a disaster. And so in conclusion, these are just some of the major challenges that I have found uh, in my research. Uh, I mentioned the incidents assistance uh, centers. Social media is always a big challenge. The spontaneous memorials are uh, an important factor too. And you have to decide, for example, on how long they should last and what you should do with all the items that have been left at the spontaneous memorial. And, and similar to that, uh, donations can be very, very difficult to handle. Uh, one example is what happened in Newtown in Connecticut after the Sandy Hook shooting in 2012. Uh, the city received more than 65,000 teddy bears and they were so overwhelmed with stuff that that became... I mean... and movies and documentaries, you always have to be aware of that there will be discussions about that too. And these two pictures uh, show uh, a good example, I think, of how difficult discussions can become uh, regarding monuments. Uh, in Norway, you might have heard, we have had some very, very difficult talks and a long time trying to find a, a nice and a good way of commemorating uh, the 69 people who died on the island of Utøya in 2011. The picture on the top here uh, won uh, an international competition 
Uh, it was called um, Emery Wound, and it was designed by a Swedish uh, designer and architect uh, and an artist. But there was so much uh, discussion about that and so many complaints about it that uh, the whole idea was scrapped. But nevertheless, the Norwegian government had to pay uh, the artist a lot of money. And now the picture on the bottom shows the new design for another type of monument that is being built on the dock that's leading out to the But at the same time, the cost has risen enormously. The price for the memory wound at the top was supposed to be around 40 million euros. And then Kelly, you're breaking up a little bit. And if you can wrap up as well. I think we've lost his audio. Are ah. also designing uh, your work after a disaster. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final presentation for the session is from Yijing Wang it of Erasmus University in the Netherlands, whose work is focusing on the challenges COVID-19 has created for integration of refugees into their host societies. Taking an employee-centered approach to understanding refugee support and its consequences, Yijing will present her work on addressing the refugee crisis, but how? Thank you, Odora. And let me share my screen here. So can you see my slides? Yes, no problem. Thank you so much. So it's great a pleasure to uh, to be here. And my research focus is on organizational and corporate communication. So if you have any question or interest in my research, please please feel free to contact me. And this study, I look into the crisis in a different uh, situation so about refugee crisis. I examine how corporate refugee support is perceived by organizational um, employees and to what extent different types of supports may generate a positive employee identification. So first, let me give you a bit background of this research. In 2020 alone, there is an estimation of 272 million international uh, migrants globally, and the pandemic further complicated the circumstances. And people's lives are also challenged, those people who are forced to flee. At the global level, the ongoing refugee crisis called for the engagement of different social actors in addressing the challenge of refugee integration within host societies. And among these actors, who are playing important role, one uh, sector is the private sector. So they are actually doing a lot contributing to refugee integration in the host societies. However, their efforts to elevate the ongoing refugee crisis is only addressed in the literature recently. So for example, in my paper published in 2019, we argue that business support of refugee integration is recognized by employees as a manifestation of corporate social responsibility, which may enhance organizational identification among employees because the linkage between corporate social responsibility and employee identification has been well established in the CSR literature. However, that study only proposed a conceptual model and to what extent refugee integration into labor market can affect employees still remains under investigated for lack of evidence from empirical studies. That's why in this research, I empirically test four types of um, corporate refugee support and to what extent they will form employee perceptions. So in this slide, you can see the four types of corporate refugee support. The first one is corporate social advocacy. It has become a new phenomenon in recent years, and it basically tells the businesses make a public statement on pressing a complex social political issues without any political relevance to an organization. So now we see there are more and more organizations committing to corporate social advocacy. While they try to align a group of stakeholders, they also run the risk of isolating the others. For example, during the Trump's presidency, a few American corporations made public statements that they support refugees. So they had a very clear stand on this point. 
The second type of refugee support is corporate sponsorship. It refers to a collaboration based on two-sided batter, including the corporate provision of resources in exchange for a promotional exposure by the collaborating cooperating entities such as NGOs. So it is often regarded as a temporary collaboration or called the transactional collaboration in the literature. In comparison, the corporate NGO partnership refers to the transformational collaboration, which often entails a long run collaboration between an organization and the NGO. And the last type of um, support is the directly hiring employees, hiring refugees as employees. So that's a direct route to integrate employees into the workplace. It is also driving force of public confidence on immigration and integration systems within the host societies. So in my study, I compared these four types of corporate refugee support, and I conducted an online experiment to test their impacts on employee perceptions. So in addition to examining employee attitudes on the four types of corporate refugee support, I also conducted a cross-cultural comparison between two countries, the US and the UK. These two countries were chosen for the comparative study for two reasons. The first reason is that in both countries, leading global business firms already actively engaged in contributing to refugee settlement in manifold ways. For example, in the US, over 46 businesses became members of the TAND partnership, including some big names that we all recognize. And in the UK, businesses across industries such as um, Earth Young, GSK, Henny Story, and Virgin Group all provided ongoing support for refugees, spanning from hiring to investment and funding for humanitarian response and livelihood. The second reason I analyze these two countries is because corporate social advocacy has become an established practice in the US, and it is right on the rise in the UK. So companies taking a public stance on refugee support might vary in these two countries in terms of to what extent it will be perceived by employees to reflect their organizational prestige. To test the proposed hypothesis, here I present the conceptual model. And in the model, you can see that I assume the impact of corporate refugee support on employee attitudes is mediated by perceived organizational morality. So I argue that morality serves as a mediator here. Basically, to what extent the positive impact will be on employee attitudes depends on whether employees do consider this refugee support from uh, the organizational morality. And in terms of the hypothesis, I argue that the corporate NGO partnership compared to the other three types of refugee support will have a more important or positive impact on employee attitudes. And the reasoning is because this type of corporate refugee support often aims at the long term collaboration between um, corporations and NGOs. And it also has a long run effect. That's why we call it the transformational collaboration. And in terms of the cross country comparison, I argue that corporate uh, corporate social advocacy will have a more impact uh, on among the US em employees compared to the UK employees. In comparison, the other three types of refugee support, their impact on employee attitudes might be indifferent. So through the online experiment, um, to conduct the online experiment, I collected the data through the online platform Prolific, and I used the two filters to find the respondents. One filter is that only employees of for-profit businesses were invited to participate in the experiment. And the second is that their country of residence needed to be either the UK or the US. The final sample consisted of 301 valid respondents. And countrywide, I had 336 from the UK and 265 from the US. Among all the participants, only 131 participants indicated that their organizations engaged in refugee support in the past. So the percentage is not surprisingly high. Uh, here I present the key findings. I didn't include any technical details, so you have to trust me. Uh, basically, all four hypotheses are part, either fully confirmed or partially confirmed. So I did discover that um, the corporate NGO collaboration, the partnership, has an outstanding performance on forming organizational uh, identification and a perceived external prestige.
it's definitely better than uh, directly hiring employees or um, engaging in corporate social advocacy. However, one surprising result is that the impact of sponsorship is indifferent compared to partnership. So basically we could say partnership and sponsorship are more or less equally the same in terms of influencing the attitudes among employees. And the second result is that I do confirm the mediation effect of organizational morality in the sense that morality uh, basically mediates all the confirmed significant effects from corporate refugee support to employee attitudes. And a surprising, another surprising result is that I found corporate sponsorship actually generates a more positive attitudes among the UK employees than the US employees. This is a very significant result, but I'm still looking for an uh, explanation for it. So if you have any suggestion, any idea, please let me know, because I'm really wondering why uh, sponsorship is perceived more positively in the UK. So the implications of my study. Here I list the four key implications. The first one is that businesses can consider partnership and sponsorship as their CSR strategies for contributing to refugee settlement, because both forms of refugee support are likely to affect employee attitudes positively. And second, when communicating such strategies to employees, businesses should emphasize on the moral value of their commitments because moral value is identified as a mediator in this relationship. So it means their willingness, the organization's willingness to improve societal welfare through contributing to humanitarian support and social justice. And third, the impact of corporate social advocacy on employee attitudes is less straightforward. So businesses should take the cultural and uh, political context into account when depending when they decide to take a public stance on refugee support or not. And last but not the least, integrating refugees into the labor market turned out to be the least favorite form of refugee support among employees. It probably implies that overlooking employee attitudes can simplify the situation, as the congruence between employees and organizations with respect to refugee support may directly affect organizational out outcomes. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention and looking forward to your feedback. Thank you for that. And thank you to all of our speakers for their presentations and sharing the research. You know, I think all of the presentations were really, really interesting. So before we get into the discussion and questions. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that our next session will actually be in just a few weeks on the 29th of April. So more details are available online and the registration will open soon. So that bit of housekeeping uh, out of the way. I'd like to now open uh, to questions, comments or thoughts for the presenters and about the topics. And just feel free to jump in, uh, including from from our presenters to each other as well. May I ask a question to Tanya and her colleague? Yeah, because you also conducted the experiment uh, design, which is very interesting to me. Um, I wonder, did you do a pretest of your experiment at Stumli? before you collected the data? Because now looking at the, the insignificant results, I might wonder, could it have something to do with the experiment design itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we conducted a qualitative pretest. Um, so um, along with interviews, um, we have tested um, whether personification was perceived as personification and whether the fear inducing messages were also um, perceived as fear inducing messages. So um, the experimental design, um, as we set it up, should have been uh, successful in implying um, personification and fear appeals. Um, however, um, the strategies um, itself as they are used by the um, by the organizations um, personification did show as not relevant and for fear appeals we found the tendencies. Thank you. This is a very interesting study to me. Thank you. Janine, we can't hear you. Yeah, I just realized <laughs> before, before I was like, OK, yeah, you always have to turn on the microphone. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that Tanya and I, we discussed that um, before. And I think regarding the fear inducing message, I mean, in fear appeal research, it's always the same. The fear appeal in the activist organizations uh, campaigns is just too strong. Um, normally, it's always the best to use a medium fear appeal 
Um, and I think that the intention is always yeah, to provoke, um, but obviously it's not the most effective way in this case. So it might be better to just use a medium fear appeal. And also regarding the personification, um, we thought, because in, in our study, we tested the personification um, with words. So it was included in a text. And maybe there's a different effect when uh, you use the personification in a picture. So you really see an animal acting like a human being. Um, yeah, and that would be something we would like to test again. Uh, so maybe in a follow up study um, and next time we can tell you more about that. Thank you. I have a, I have a question for uh, Tanya and the team as well, uh, Janine. Um, uh, as a marketeer, I'm quite interested in terms of the uh, in the UK, we have the advertising standard agencies. Were there any complaints or did the ads get pulled at all? Um, and did that have an impact on it? Or is that something that was not controlled for or, or considered? Um, so we used um, reactants, um, possible reactants reactions, so negative defensive reactions. We also included this measure and we could see um, that for personification, the, um, the um, descriptive re results were also heightened. So um, using personification in um, the language form apparently also um, heightened the reactants reactions and um, people did not perceive this as something they um, as something they, um, I don't know, like as, as um, something they would like to engage in. Thank Ali, you. Um, you had a question as well. Hi, so did, uh, did you say me? Sorry. <laughs> Hi, so it's uh, for Tanya and Janine as well. So um, yeah, I was actually in, uh, really interested um, in that and I just kind of wanted to ask about um, the aesthetic sort of um, personification, which obviously you've touched on now, uh, but um, just kind of do you think or what extent do you think that uh, sort of the uncanny plays in, like plays a role in negative reactions to personification of animals in the visual um, campaigns. Um, as we have only analyzed um, the personification in a language form, we did not um, find any results on this specific question, but we for sure want to include it um, in visually in the next study and then we will update you <laughs> on our findings there. <laughs> what I think is interesting about this is that it goes to some other findings in politics and in a few other domains where the more negative messaging is less successful these days. People don't want to hear the negativity. So maybe the personification issue is that, you know, if you are a happy meat eater, you don't want to think about it as having a personality. And so, and so in terms of EPPM, that pr pushes you over the edge where it's a motivator to a demotivator, perhaps. Maybe that's part of it too. Yeah, exactly. Um, and in EPPM, the um, the suggestion is to use the medium fear appeal and then combine it with um, possible if the su suggesting the efficacy of possible behaviors um, so that the um, heightened um, need for action is then um, actually um, triggered alongside with the emotional reactions. Yeah, and Tanya and I, we do a lot of research on the EPPM and we also conducted another study um, and we varied the efficacy. And um, now we are planning another study to vary the efficacy with three levels. So what's the best combination between fear appeal, low, medium, high, and the efficacy? And in the um, activist uh, organizations campaigns, the um, efficacy is completely missing. So that's just what Tanya said. I think that's more or less a problem. And that's why a lot of times people are more yeah, I don't want to say they are shocked, but it's not that effective. So, yeah. Delia. Yeah, thank you. Um, this was really interesting. I, I think I have a more general question for Ijing and then for Tanya and, uh, and, and Janine, because I'm coming from a different, uh, I guess, sub-discipline in communication and a different uh, methodological paradigm. And um, yeah, I, I was wondering, about what you would call mediating factors, because to me this seems rather simplistic. 
to assume that uh, a feature of communication, say, uh, you know, the use of emotion or uh, the, the, the personification, yeah, can tell you something about the efficacy, quote unquote, or the impact, quote unquote, of the of the message, right? I think that, for instance, I, I come from rhetorical, I'm thinking of rhetorical or persuasive studies, and in a way I'm not surprised that, for instance, emotion and facts uh, are stronger together. This is what persuasion suggests, right? That all three pillars of communication would play a role. Then for aging, I'm thinking, you know, things like the, the ideological leaning of the of the employees who were surveyed must certainly play a role, the timing, whether the questions that you ask them were during the refugee crisis or after. So I'm wondering how in your research designs you're capturing all of these mediating factors that play into the complexity of meaning making, because communication is not a simple transmission of a message, right? Um, so I'm curious because I come from a different uh, angle than, than you. Yeah, sure. That's definitely a good question uh, to challenge the <laughs> experiment design that we, we are both uh, working on for our research. Uh, in my case, I think the thing is that to um, presume a direct impact from uh, external interruption to uh, employee attitudes is very simplified, and that's probably oversimplified the situation. So what we try to look into is the mechanism that how these attitudes are formed and the formed through the interventions. And I'm looking for a kind of a mediation factor here. This factor can somehow be related to the interventions and also relating to the uh, attitudes which are formed among employees. And in this case, I use the attribution theory to argue that the perceived morality is related to corporate social responsibility, which has been argued in the literature, and it can also form employee attitudes. So the mediation effect basically argues that the impact from the external intervention can only be realized if it's going through morality. So if it's not going through moderate morality, then the linkage between CSR or refugee support and the employee attitudes change cannot be established. And when I try to design the experiment, I actually use the fictitious brands uh, to uh, let the uh, respondents read a kind of a par paragraph of text. And then I ask them, how do they perceive about the morality of this company? There are a few questions which are asking about the morality that they perceive from the text. So I try to also control the confounding factors uh, which are relating to their organizational culture, relating to their personal trait, such as to what extent they think uh, the refugee issue is really important personally. And taking these factors out, if we still find this mediation effect, we can probably safely to say uh, there is indeed something in between which are unfolding the mechanism of the linkage. That's what, that, that was a really nice explanation <laughs> about how an experiment works. <laughs> Thank you. Gary, did you have a question or comment? muted by the way yeah no no sorry sorry it's just um yeah i mean i mean i should say i'm not a um, communications or pr subject specialist here but um in the exciting life that i lead i was reading some papers yesterday on um, climate change because i'm updating a module um for september and um one of the papers that i read uh, made use of united nations data on um and then the two bits of data it uses, one on mortality and one on um, how people perceive priorities. And I think thinking about what Audra said and, and Janine about the medium and fear is, you know, the mortality data um, that the UN published, um, you know, shows that people uh, more commonly die from um, air pollution and, um, and water pollution. And um, in, in the UN survey, which I think um, had 97 people um, contributing to it, um, said the issues that people prioritised, um, well, well, I guess the issues that you um, you would think of, it's things like education and health and jobs and, um, you know, clean water and sanitation and, and climate change, you know, came at the bottom of, of, of people's priorities. So, you know, maybe it's not, um, it's not, you know, the use of fear or the medium it is how people frame the priorities in terms of how they respond to, um, you know, the message that's being conveyed. Um, 
I mean, the paper, the paper reading yesterday, um, we're looking at action on climate change and, you know, making an argument that there's more benefit to be had from from solving, you know, issues of inequality and air and water pollution than they are at the moment on issues around climate change, you know, because um, those are the things that people are prioritising, obviously dying from at the moment. Um, and it's just, you know, just struck me as it's the, the other side of the argument about fear and, and the message, the medium, that it, it might just not sit in people's, um, you know, decision making frame at the moment, climate change um, or animal rights, which is where my people, you know, don't respond to these things. But again, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a communications or PR or teach strategy um, and the paper reading. Um, you know, we're a strategy paper rather than, um, but I think the data is quite interesting in terms of being the other side of, of what, you know, what's being talked about um, this afternoon. Well, Gary, I think your point goes both to Delia's paper and also to uh, Tanya's first paper. You know, in terms of Delia's, the, the question of how do you get people involved in, in activism, especially as we're in an online environment, and it becomes kind of internally focused and then also with the point that came up from Tanya's um, first presentation that it was about the education and the consumer education that seemed to have the biggest impact. Um, could you both you know, jump in and on some of those on some of what Gary is talking about and and connect it to some of your research? Yeah, of course. Um, so basically, what um, the like what you've um, said and what you've discussed um, is um, brings up very interesting points. Um, so what we try to do in the research is um, we try to analyze like what are these effects of um, communicating emotions, of um, linking emotions um, to past behaviors, to current behaviors, and which possible future consequences um, these could have, um, and what could the effects be if we link. Um, the like if we try to um ac activate the emotional reactions um regarding people's behaviors and um could this activate a need um, for action change so um this is basically what we are analyzing in the research and um for some communication strategies we find um, specific effects and for others there are no specific differences so this is basically um suggestions on how to best build communication um, materials um trying to include these specific strategies that are working and do they you have you yeah, have a different if, take with trying to get people active and trying to get them actually caring about about this. Well, actually, I was going to circumvent your proposal, Audra, and respond to to Gary's point by saying that um, in in the other paper that we have worked on in terms of how Fridays for Future has adapted its message to the pandemic, it became pretty clear right from the beginning that to remain relevant during the time of a pandemic, the movement had to reframe its message. So from the point of view of the of the movement organizers, yeah, they, they needed to make themselves relevant again. And they did it by reincorporating or what we call hijacking the pandemic vocabulary. Uh, we, we've yeah, we've identified several stages, but basically this um, this idea of uh, repositioning, reclaiming the notion of the crisis, reclaiming the idea of a health crisis and linking it to climate change so that you're able to say, yes, it is a crisis situation. And yes, we're doing our part to 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 uh, to help with this situation. But climate change is also a crisis. So in that sense, the, the need to reframe the message during a crisis situation is really crucial for a movement to stay relevant. Uh, and if a movement does not manage to, 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 to quickly adapt its message to what is going on and to re-establish its relevance, then I'm afraid that they lose the attention of uh, the, the, their own followers and the ability to re-mobilize people uh, and, and, and you know, get them on board with that. It was quite interesting in the case of Fridays for Future because on the one hand, this is a contentious movement that challenges the power structures. 
And at the same time, in the beginning of the pandemic, they were forced to say, well, not forced, but but they went down the, the route of saying, listen to the scientists, therefore listen to what the government is saying. This put them in a very awkward situation where they were opposing power structures while at the same time advising followers to follow through with the, the, the measures and the policies proposed by the government. Uh, and yeah, that was a, a very interesting tension in terms of sorting it out on a framing level. So yeah, this is how I would choose to address Gary's point because we, we also considered, yeah, how, how important it is for a movement to be able to link itself to what is going on here and now. Well, and Kiel, that, that also brings to mind your piece because it's it's the what happens afterwards. Climate change doesn't really have an afterwards, but there are most likely going to be victims of it over time. Um, and there will be people who are displaced, people who are affected by it. Um, how do you think that your work in looking at people who are responders to different climate events um, and, and people who are affected by different climate events might actually bring some perspective on, on how to motivate people, maybe not in the prevention, but at least in managing it? Yeah, I think that's a very, very good question. And uh, I will believe that uh, as uh, climate change gets more and more attention, uh, there will also be more and more attention focused on, uh, you know, how to have a monument or how to have a, a way of, uh, of, uh, of memorializing what has happened before. And it's interesting also to see uh, uh, during COVID-19, uh, already in, I think it was in April of last year, there were discussions among uh, profession professionals in the States about how to memorialize uh, victims of uh, the pandemic. And they are thinking about the, actually building something uh, that people can come and visit because it's it's so important to, to have one way of, of going to a place and uh, memorializing those who have died or those who have been affected. Well, and that, I think that's a great point because we're going to, you know, it's, we still feel like we're in the midst of it, especially for people who are in lockdown still or mm. starting to come out. But for a lot of people, there will be a year on that year point that you mentioned in, in your talk about memorializing at the loss of their loved ones. You know, and that's that seems to be, it's a really interesting moment that where where because it's uh, um what Jan Jin would call a sticky crisis because it's ongoing and there's lots of layers and complexity to it um there seems to be though a challenge in thinking about post crisis recovery with covid as well so and that actually i think you know Yin Jin you talked about the, the explanation for the US versus UK on the sponsorship. As an American living in the UK, I would actually offer a bit of an argument that I think the UK likes the notion of fair play more than the US does. You know, especially coupled with your finding around the negativity, generally speaking, towards employment, that suggests a bit of an the anti-immigrant sort of sentiment that both the UK and US have, but I think there's a lot more negativity you know, in, in the US because the US is functionally, so I'll be controversial, I'll just say it's functionally a third world country because the people who are very wealthy are incredibly well off and the people who are not are incredibly impoverished. So I think a lot of the negativity around the sponsorship, around the employment is most likely about a perception that it's there's taking away from people who are already there. UK, a la Brexit, we have the similar kinds of challenges <laughs> and identifications, but it's not so, there's a different ethic. So I actually wasn't surprised that the UK rated a bit higher on at least that notion of the sponsorship. And for those, of, for those others, because we have a number of folks who are in the UK right now, and I'm sure they may have different perspectives on that as well. 
Thank you so much, Odora, because I try to find the reasonings from the literature, but it's really high, really hard to find a very concrete thought on it. And you have a very unique position to share opinions both about the UK and the US. So uh, yeah, this is a great insight indeed. You may actually look for literature on the immigration debate more mm -hmm. than that might be more relevant in terms of the xenophobia side of it compared to to maybe the social responsibility side. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, actually, if I could jump, could I jump in with really quickly um, in terms of Ijing's uh, uh, research, I was also thinking that maybe a country like Canada might be of interest here because, um, yeah, multiculturalism is an official policy and there is a practice of integrating uh, newcomers into the labor market. So it would be actually quite interesting to see if this, uh, yeah, if this idea of integrating refugees in labor market is still the least preferred in the Canadian context, given the larger ideological, um, yeah, ideological context when it comes to refugee, not refugees, but but newcomers to Canada and how they have to be integrated within the Canadian society. It's always through labor. Right. So in that sense, I would expect that in the Canadian context, you will you shouldn't see this. So if you still see it, then it would be quite interesting to, to ask why. <laughs> well, that's interesting. That would be really nice to uh, to have for Canada as a third country for the comparison. Yeah, because what I discovered is indeed that I, I didn't expect such a negative impact on uh, among employees about hiring refugees. But apparently that's really the worst compared to the other three in terms of whether it really enhances morality, uh, how it is perceived by employees for their external prestige. Uh, it doesn't really have any value there, or at least it's, it's formulated in this way. So I'm still looking for a clear reasoning for that, but it's pretty clear from the data that I can see uh, the other type of refugee support are perceived more positively. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I have another question. Um, yeah, I was going to say you had your hand up for a while. Yeah, um, I really like your presentation. And when we talked about the um, climate activists, I thought about another movement, um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And what do you think? Because, I mean, the climate activists, they really changed their whole behavior. I mean, there were in Germany, at least, there were no um, strikes in person. They organized everything online. Um, but compared to the Black Lives Matter movement, there were a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of, how can you say, I think they met a lot of time in person. And you already mentioned the leadership as an important, yeah, let's say variable. Do you think it has something to do with that? Or do you think it's more because of the anger the people felt in this moment? Um, or what do you think, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, let's say movements more or less. Yeah, thank you, Janine. I didn't really reflect on this difference in a systematic way. So everything that I have to offer is more of a, a personal opinion. But That's um, fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in terms of leadership, I think that you may be on to something because I, I have a bunch of students looking at Black Lives Matter campaigns across Europe nowadays. And one of the things that we have uh, we have seen is that yeah, the, the importance of local organizing structures is crucial to the format that Black Lives Matter takes within particular localities. And those, for instance, in the Netherlands who are able to rely upon existing uh, um, civil society structures that have been traditionally involved in the anti-racist fight are more able to mobilize and to organize and to do things such as protests. Still, long term, yeah, the long term life of these events right beyond the protest, what happens next remains a little bit unclear. Uh, things might happen online among individuals, but it's unclear whether there is a movement in the real sense of the world uh, um, of the world. Yeah, it, that, that, that continues by doing some specific things. Um, yeah, so I, I think leadership is certainly important there. Uh, anger, probably you're right in that sense, and particularly anger among specific communities, among the youth, among, um, yeah, probably 
Um, in, in some cases, I'm, I'm thinking about my students uh, here, middle class and educated who feel that this is an injustice that has been perpetrated and is just is just enough. Uh, but this might also be communities more inclined to go out uh, during the time of the pandemic in, in some ways. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's it's a good suggestion. I was I was also thinking about how Black Lives Matter, for instance, has uh, remained mobilized or has tried to mobilize during the pandemic. I think it also has to do with the fact that this is a, a, a more political issue in a way. It's about the freedom, individual freedom, individual rights, where climate change is a step removed. It's about social injustice, perhaps in, in a larger way. But with the fight against systemic racism, this is something that the individual feels, yeah, it's, it's, it's just my personal freedom uh, at stake here, my personal rights at stake here. So maybe that the issue might also play a role uh, in, in, in the fact that these movements have uh, continued to, to mobilize offline. What I can tell you, however, is that in the case of Fridays for Future, what we've seen is that Greta was the first one immediately announcing we are supporting the measures, we are going to stop. And once she has done that, that message has been amplified across the Fridays for Future uh, collectives and they immediately rallied behind her. So, yeah, in that sense here, I can see that leadership said we're going in that direction and people followed through. Yeah, I just wanted to say that maybe also with the Black Lives Matter movement, I mean, there was a concrete event that led to all the protests around the world. So that's also maybe something different because like with climate change, I mean, it's an issue and we talk about that for years. Um, so maybe that's also a difference because, yeah, so maybe that's the reason why the Black Lives Matter movement started more or less offline. Um, and the climate change activists, they said, okay, we need to listen to scientists because that's what we say for years. So that's the reason why we now have to stay at home. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I also wanted to ask a question. Um, I had a question for Kier. Um, I um, found your research super interesting and I wanted to ask um, the interviews you conducted, um, were they um, mainly focused on victims that have experienced these crisis situations and you asked them um, what they consider for themselves to be relevant um, or is, um, does it also portray like an ideal way to cope with these specific situations? Is it something that is also suggested by psychologists, for example? I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Now? Yes. Yep. That's a very, very good question. And actually, it's kind of a mixture, I would say, because I talked to lots of individuals, and they could, of course, uh, only talk about their own personal experience and what uh, they found to be working for them. But I also have been uh, conducting lots of interviews with uh, therapists who have, of course, uh, a much broader um, background and who could talk more broadly about uh, what uh, people in general need. And for example, one of them is a, a woman from uh, from the United Kingdom, Dr. Anne Eyer, you might have heard of her. Uh, and she do does now a lot of work with uh, victims and survivors after the Manchester bombing. And uh, they have done, uh, it's really interesting to see what they have done uh, in regards to taking care of, of uh, family members and the victims. And they have, for example, found that they should organize uh, a lot of different support groups for various uh, victims. They found that it wasn't wise to have everyone in the same room because they were in so many different uh, aspects of life. So they instead decided to have one group for young people, one group for the people working at the stadium, one group for first responders, etc. So there is, uh, I think, lots to learn from uh, th therapists uh, around the world. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, and you also brought up the Manchester Arena bombing and, and what struck me that or that I really appreciated during your presentation was the expansion of what a first responder is, because we saw in that case that, I mean, the Sikh community within Manchester 
organized um, rides, water. I mean, when you watched it on social media, the work that they were doing to try and help and support people who had been affected at the initially, yet those are people that are often not included as first responders. We only think in terms of the official folks. So, I mean, that's an, that's an interesting, you know, and we, I think every major disaster attack has seen those types of, of folks coming more to the fore. So how do you think they need to be supported com in comparison or alongside traditional first responders? Yeah, that's a good question too. And we could talk for, for a long time about that. Uh, what we have found in Norway, uh, we learned a lot after the terror attacks in, in Utøya. And uh, of course, there were lots of neighbors and people living uh, around the area who saved many lives because they were able to go out by boat and uh, get people uh, who were swimming away from the terrorist. But what happened afterwards was that uh, the government and uh, the Labour Party who had organized that, uh, that uh, youth camp kind of forgot about them and uh, they didn't have a voice anymore uh, in discussions. And that was one of the main reasons that uh, this monument became such a big controversy, that uh, the neighbors, the people who had been another type of first responders were not listened to. And uh, they had a voice and the people didn't listen and the government didn't listen. And that's why it ended up with uh, everything having to be canceled. So you really need to, I think, have a very wide perspective when you're looking at the first responders and not forget about them uh, when everything has died down and you go back to normal. Well, in putting these kind of disasters into the context of community and, and asking the question about how communities are affected, whether it's from protesters, whether it's an, an organization and its workers within a community, situating groups within their communities is also, I think, a part of probably building more sustainable responses to crises, to threats, to all of that. Yeah, and just one comment, if I can, uh, about movements where that we talked about uh, earlier. If you haven't already, I suggest if you can see this book, maybe it's uh, uh, in a mirror. But it's uh, a book, a very small book by two students who survived the mass shooting, uh, the school shooting in Parkland in Orlando uh, by David and Laureen Hogg, two siblings who survived. And they were the orchestrators of the big movement that was called Never Again, that uh, organized all over your, the States and in some parts of Europe. And they did a very good job with organizing that through social media and also through regular media by being very, very active and uh, gaining support from each other and from other students. So there is a lot to learn there too, I think. Do we have other questions from our participants or from our audience? I think these, you know, in, in so we'll wrap up and I want to thank the presenters once again. These were some really interesting and, and I think thought provoking pieces that have implications within the communication field, but I think without or outside of it as well. Um, so I thank you again and welcome everybody back for our next go round as well. Thank, thank you, you Audra, for the great organization. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You too. And we will stop the recording.